Hello class. So this is going to be the last video on section 5.3. I just want to do one more example. Um, in the previous video, we did examples using the second part of the fundamental theorem of calculus, right, where we, in order to find the definite integral of a continuous function on the interval you're working on, you just find an antiderivative and evaluate at the end. Right, so we did that. Uh, we did one example that was kind of uh, pretty easy to do, right, part A. And then we did another one, which was definitely more work, where we had to split our definite integral into two different integrals, find each of those separately, and then plug everything back in. But in the end, it wasn't really hard. Right? It was easy to calculate both definite integrals. So hopefully, uh, the, the process for doing that is always the same. The only thing you have to be careful is that whatever function you're integrating has to be continuous in that interval. Right? So I gave you an example that for the function 1 over x, if you want to find the definite integral from negative 1 to 1, 1 over x dx, you can't use the fundamental theorem of calculus because 1 over x is not continuous on the interval negative 1 to 1. Right? So here you can't use the fundamental theorem of calculus. Now I want to show you an example of applying the first part of the fundamental theorem of calculus. Um, specifically, that the derivative of the area function is f of x. Um, now this, really the most important application for this is that the area function is, a is an antiderivative of f, which of course we use in the fundamental theorem of calculus, right? That's how we derived this formula, right? We went over all this derivation using the fact that the area function is an antiderivative of f. So really, the, the, sec the first part of the fundamental theorem of calculus is, is part of the second part, in a way. But I, I do want to focus a little bit on, on this statement here, because they might ask you questions related to this in my math lab. All the examples are going to be the same. They're all going to be the same sort of work. So I'm just going to show you one example, basically. Now, before we do this one here, right? so we want to simplify the expression, we want to take the derivative of the integral from zero to x squared of the t over t squared plus four. Before we do this, let's do the simpler version. Say we want to find the derivative of zero to x of one over t squared plus four dt. Now notice that I wrote things a little bit different. Here I wrote dt over t squared over four. Here I wrote one over t squared plus four d, uh, times dt. They're the same thing. Right? So, so if you see the dt on the top like this or the dt on the side, it means the same thing. Okay? So how do we simplify this? Well, um, we first have to check. Remember, what does the FTC part one say? If this function inside is continuous and differentiable on whatever interval you're working at, then the whole area function is continuous and differentiable on that interval. So going back here, one over t squared plus four, is that continuous on the interval zero to x? Well, it is, right? t squared plus four, one over t squared plus four is continuous everywhere. Uh, you can check, um, you can see it graphically, but basically the only thing that would make this not continuous is if the denominator is zero, t squared plus four is always greater than zero for us, right? So this is continuous everywhere, right? So this whole thing, is continuous and differentiable. Why? Because if you notice, this is the same thing as the area function. This is precisely the area function. We have a continuous function um, on the inside. We want, we're taking the integral from zero to x. That's basically calculating the net area on the interval zero to x. By definition, that's the area function. This is the derivative of the area function, okay? Now, since this function on the inside is continuous and, and on the interval zero to x, we know that the area function is continuous on zero to x and differential. And then also we know exactly what the derivative is. Right? Go to the FTC part one. How do you find the derivative of something like this? Well, basically, just look at your function f and replace the t's with x. Right? It's as simple as that. So you go down here. As long as you verify that this function inside is continuous on the interval 0 to x, you're good. What's the derivative of this? Just replace all the t's with x's. 
It's as simple as that. Okay. So note, the only thing you really have to check is check that f of t is continuous on the interval 0 to x. In this case, the lower bound might change, obviously, but in this case, 0 to x. And as long as you can do that, what's the derivative? You replace the t's with x's. So now let's do the problem we were actually asked to solve. I want to find d dx of the integral from 0 to x squared of what? The same thing. It's 1 over t squared plus 4 dt. Now, notice, in the previous example, where it was just x, this was just the area function. All this thing here is just a of x. So, and let me actually have this here as, as, a, as an aside. This thing here, uh, oops. This whole thing is by definition a of x. Now remember, the input is the upper bound here. Now what's the difference here? The upper bound is different. What is it that changed? Well, the input changed. So how can we rewrite this in terms of the area function? Well, we're changing the input of the area function. If you see this, this whole thing is the area function. What are we doing? We're changing the input. The input was x. The input is now x squared. So we can write this as a of x squared. Okay. So what is this saying? Whenever you have an expression like this, and the upper bound is just not x, whenever it's something else, so a function of x, so any expression involving x, how do you treat that? You treat it as a composition. You have the area function, and whatever you have here, you plug it in as the input. So what does that say about how we find this derivative? Well, we have to use the chain rule. We have a composition, right? By the chain rule, what is this? Take the derivative of the outside function, leave the inside the same, and multiply by the derivative of the inside function, which in this case is 2x. And that's the trick. Right? That's, when if, if the, um, as we did here in, the, in this first part of this example, if your upper bound is just x and you want to find the derivative, just replace the teeth with x. Right? So this is your answer. As long as, of course, you always have to check that your function of little f is continuous on the interval 0 to x. That's one case. The only other case is that your upper bound is not just x, but an expression involving x. In that case, you do this extra step here, where you rewrite the area, the derivative of the area function as the derivative of the area function with the input being the expression of x that you found. And then of course, by the chain rule, this is what the derivative is. Okay, so let's go ahead and simplify this. So in the previous part, we already found what a prime is. Right? Remember this was a prime. Okay. So a prime, so let me have this here also as an, as, as an aside. Um, actually, that's not going to work. So by the previous part, we know that a prime of x was just, well, just replace the t's with x's. So what's x prime composed, composed of x squared? Well, wherever you see an x, plug in x squared. We still have the 2x here. And then you simplify. And then 1 times 2x is 2x. And this is your answer. So that's why this works. Uh, if you want a shortcut version, so the shortcut version is, is if you have an expert, uh, so how do I wanna say this? The shortcut version is immediately replace the T's with whatever you have here, like you did in the previous part. So just replace the T's 
uh, with whatever expression of x you have. Um, well, mm, yeah, yeah, just replace the t's with whatever expression of x you have. In this case, we, have, we had x squared, so replace the t not with x, but with x squared, and then multiply by the derivative of that function, right? whatever the upper bound is, so multiply by the derivative of that. So you can think of it either way. If you want to write out the whole chain rule, I usually write it out so I remember. If you want the shortcut, just replace the t with whatever function you have here, and then multiply by the derivative of that function. In either case, those are the only two types of problems. Either the upper bound is just x, or the upper bound is a function of x. And in either case, I showed you how to do it. Now that should cover everything in section 5.3. If you have any questions, please let me know. But again, the key point is, now we have an easy way to calculate definite integral.